Ah, that's some mighty fine H two O. Cheers. Ble- that's that's some mighty fine H two O. Here's to you, sir. Here you go. Oh, oh here's to you. We're oh. gonna dink it up. Oh, this way. Dink, 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 like, dink. Uh, like Amy and Tina hosting the uh, Golden the, Globes. the Golden Globes, trying to get that thing added up. Just ja, get that angle, of that background. Just right. Hey, it's good to see everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Facebook Live or LinkedIn Live or uh, I guess that's it. We're not really on YouTube yet, so we're going to have to work on work on that. Uh, Pete and Brian for Leadership and Laughs. What's happening in Denver today, buddy? Do you know uh, Do you know what today is? Speaking of it's that. National Potato Chip Day. No, it is a national day. It's National Anthem Day. What? It's National Anthem Day. Happy National uh, Anthem Day. Happy National Anthem Day, I believe you. So, yeah, Fra- uh, Francis Scott Key wrote the words to the Star Spangled Banner back in the War of 1812, but um, it was just a poem. It didn't have music to it at that time. And uh, so, you know, by the early 1900s, there were several different versions of the Star Spangled Banner floating around the United States as being sung by school kids everywhere. So President Wilson said, we need one. We just need to have one uh, of these. So he had the uh, Bureau of Education hire five musicians, and one of them was John Philip Sousa. Stop it. Yeah. And uh, to and to ask them to come up with the song that we know today. And then, uh, That's unbelievable. And then later on, President Hoover... Who, Herbert Hoover uh, signed uh, legislation that made the Star Spangled Banner America's national anthem. And that happened on March 3rd in like 1931. So that's why this day day. is National Anthem Day. We will not be singing it today, however, but uh, vocal cords. You don't have them warmed up. That's good, man. I'll tell you, leadership and laugh starts off strong with a little bit of knowledge there coming across. So that's good, buddy. Things are good out here in, uh, in, in, in Alabama. I don't have a funny story or a neat witty. Uh, I mean, I really thought it was potato chip day. So I was way off on that. So but listen, we got a, we have got a full show tonight. We have got a lot of fun things. We are, we are bringing back lead it or leave it. We've got, we've got over under, we got the daily Disney. So we got a lot of fun things to do today. So let's go ahead and uh, get rocking. Fire it up, man. March is here. February's gone. You know, winter's going to come in like March in like a lion, go out like a lamb, all those things. So uh, if you're just joining us again, Pete and Brian, Leadership and Laughs, do us a favor. If you're on Facebook or LinkedIn, especially on Facebook, hit, hit that like button, hit those heart buttons. In fact, if you want to comment and put somebody's name in the comments, it'll pop up in their feed and you'll be like, dude, you got to watch this best hour of the week. So forward it, share it, comment on it. Uh, we're going to have a great hour. Just have some fun. Brian, well, how about politics, buddy? You want to talk about politics? No. Why? Not really. Uh, well, you know, you, here's the thing. Everything can be tied to uh, politics. And certainly there's a lot of uh, leadership involved in politics. And, you know, Pete and I believe that none of us should be shrugging off that duty Correct. to and all the things that are going on in the world today, there's a lot of sadness. There's a lot of anger. Um, every time we turn on our TV or look at our phones, you know, we're uh, presented with different news stories and articles and important topics that honestly we should be reading about. Yeah. Uh, but that's not what this show is all about. No, so not this show. We encourage you to stay informed and engaged with others on these topics, just like Pete and I do. But, uh, you know, do that the rest of the week. Leadership and Laughs is just not a hard-hitting political show. Uh, we just try to keep it light. Um, some of the things that we discuss may be loosely related to uh, sure. what's going on in the world, but we try to keep it relatively stress-free for you all. And we start off with happy stories, which is what we call Leading Off with Brian. And we're 
we're back. What's up, buddy? I just feel so uh, invigorated by that opening. I do love classical music. It's funny working here at home. My wife and I are doing a hybrid thing. I go to work. She's here, and I like having classical music in the background, or perhaps some uh, some some light jazz, it, it, uh, it, watercolors on Sirius XM. Hashtag not a sponsor. Like having them in the background. My wife doesn't like working with music. She can't concentrate. She prefers the background noise of the Today Show or st stories, and and so we're not good in a room together. <laughs> we're not good in a room together. But classical, yeah. My, my basic day job is divided between like corporate communication where I'm actually writing copy and, right. uh, you know, like a uh, uh, graphic design. When I'm doing the design work, I love to right. have music on. Got to have the classical music. Uh, I, I like uh, some of the, um, you know, stuff by like two cellos. Um, what I call, uh, you know, just kick butt classical music. Yes. But when I'm writing, I can't have that on. Yes, uh, I need I need it to be quiet because I need my my own head. All right, this is not actually one of our topics tonight, but in the comments, LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever you're watching, what do you like in the background while you're working? What helps you grow as a leader? Classical music, jazz music, rock music, television stations, podcast. What's in the background? What's in the background for you? So go ahead, Brian. Get us started today on our first feel good story while that's coming in. Oh, my word. Before you even do that, say hi to our buddy, buddy Marla. Oh, hi, Marla. Marla, worked with us down at Disney for a long time. Good to see you, too, buddy. Thanks for the heart eyes. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. We love Marla. I uh, love Marla. Let's, uh, let's start in New Jersey, Pete. Got it. We're going to start in New Jersey. We call this one Answering the Call. It's a, this is our first story, and it's really just all about meeting the needs of others. Okay. And um, and answering the call for help when you know somebody asks you. So uh, we're going to go back to uh, freezing Texas for this one. Um, and this is a story about a New Jersey plumber who we see here. If you're watching the live podcast, who uh, this guy wanted to help Texans who were dealing with their burst pipes and other damage after last week's uh, big winter storms. Um, he got in the car and drove to Houston with a truck full of tools and got to work. This is uh, Andrew Mitchell. And uh, he gathered up his wife, Keisha, and his uh, two-year-old son, Blake, and drove 22 hours from Morristown. What? New Jersey, yeah, to uh, after hearing that local plumbers in uh, you know the Houston area were overwhelmed with calls uh, and that some of the customers couldn't get help for weeks. So, you know, stuff freezes. You didn't know what you were supposed to do because it never freezes in Texas. Right, right. First, we saw the pictures of entire like cars encased in ice because the, the pipes burst. And, and uh, so Andrew Mitchell and his family and, and, and his wife's brother, who's his apprentice, this is who we see here, that's Isaiah Pinnock. Uh, he went with them. And before they left New Jersey, they went around and, and bought as many plumbing supplies as they could afford uh, because not only are plumbers hard to find, but the supplies are hard to find. Supplies are hard to find. Um, anyway, as soon as they arrived, uh, locals put them in touch with um, lots of different people in desperate need of plumbing services. And within days... They had uh, dozens of jobs uh, down, yeah. so, you know. And this is this is just traditional uh, uh, leadership one hundred and one. You know, I mean, we always think about you got to have a title and you've got to have power and you got to have influence if you're going to make a difference. These these guys just what went to a store, loaded up a bunch of stuff, went down, helped people out. The whole idea of servant leadership and just putting others for yourself. I love that, man. I love and that. So we lived in Florida, Pete, where where uh, you know there'd be a hurricane, lots of power outages, and you would see just convoys of you know power companies from other places in the United States yeah. coming to uh, to help out. Such a good story, man. Thank you. That 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 kind of fires me up. Uh, real quick, as we as we go back, uh, Madison likes Disney classical music or the Coffee House. I like Coffee House too. That's good. Uh, uh, Greg likes it quiet, or sure. else he likes it quite. Don't know about that, Greg, but it's all right. I'm with you there. I'm with you there. And uh, Caleb's late. And of course, I believe Jacob was part of the, uh, yeah. Ah, excuse us while we get a beverage here. We're on. Oh. Thank you, Jacob. Appreciate that. Thanks, guys. Outstanding. 
Outstanding. All right, here we go. Uh, tell me about the nation's largest free food forest, because I hope it's close to me. You know, <laughs> Pete, you know me really well. And, uh, you know, like we, we used to uh, spend every day with Marla back then uh, working at Disney World. And, and you know, uh, if you know me at all, you know I'm a foodie. I love, Correct. I love food. And so this next story caught my attention uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's about food. And uh, number two, <laughs> it's really about a community coming together to uh, to bring um, healthy and accessible food to people who desperately need us, yeah. need it. So uh, like you can see from our title here, uh, this is the nation's largest free food forest. Uh, and the story goes like this. Um, several years ago, there was a, uh, a dormant pecan farm. Do you say pecan or pecan? God, uh, I'm going to have to ask my wife to kind of jump in there uh, with us so I can figure that out. I've always said pecan. And then when I got here, I started saying pecan. And then if you're from the South, there's a certain way you have to say it. And I've never gotten it right. So what's your preference? Uh, I'm going to go with pecan. Pecan, pecan. Uh, because it's a farm. Uh, All right, I'm going to go with pecan because that'll probably annoy most of the Southerners. So pecans. <laughs> So Pecan Farm in South Atlanta closed, and the land was quickly uh, rezoned and earmarked to become uh, low-income housing, uh, townhouses and whatnot. That They never got built, and the land just sat there in foreclosure for years. And so uh, what does Sherry say? Pecan. Okay. Excellent. Did she actually... Yeah. Yep, there it is. <laughs> there it is. Pecan. All right. Pecan. Like James Con. <laughs> But not. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, conservation fund in 2016 bought this land in order to develop uh, what was kind of an unexpected project, which is the largest um, free food forest in the country. It's more than seven acres of land and it's just full. It's got, it's got uh, over 2,500 pesticide free edible uh, and medicinal plants. Look at that. And they partnered with the U.S. Forest Service and the city of Atlanta uh, to, you know, bring this into being. And now it's tended by volunteers, hundreds of volunteers, and it's part of Atlanta's larger uh, mission to bring healthy food within half a mile of 85% of the city's 500,000 re residents by 2022. And that last little bit is so important yeah. because, you know, this is located in what's referred to as a food desert. Yeah. Um, if you've heard of a food desert, those are uh, regions where people have limited access to healthy and affordable food. Either Correct. Uh, low income or having mm -hmm. uh, travel. We have, we have a lot of these in Alabama and people get their food from the dollar general because there's a dollar general close to them, but that's all. And yeah. no fresh fruits, yeah. no vegetables, no nuts, no bear. No, you know, it, it's just yeah. all. And yeah, so it, it's basically a food desert. Food desert. So th this particular food forest is located in uh, the Browns Mill neighborhood of Southeast Atlanta, where, the, like you were saying, the closest grocery store is a 30 minute bus ride away just to go, you know, get some apples or whatever. Right. And uh, they say that, in fact, almost one fourth of Atlanta, uh, the people in Atlanta live in uh, extremely isolated, uh, isolated uh, food deserts, uh, which can put them at risk of a lot of diet related conditions. Like so obesity, what's, so what's the, what's the, what's the story behind this as far as who can go and use it? Because if it, if it was zoned for like a huge apartment complex and housing complex, it's gotta be large. Can do you have to live in the area? Can anybody come and get what they need? Did you read anything about that? You know, I, I didn't read anything about that specifically. Okay. Uh, but it's uh, it's intended for the community the of community. Uh, Brownsville. I'm sorry, Browns Mill in uh, Southeast Atlanta. Uh, the community, you know, we saw a picture here. You put it up there before where, you know, a whole bunch, they bring like schools there and yep. let let the kids work on uh, the land. And I wonder if it's like a co-op, Pete, like yes. uh, we, we have some of those like farming co-ops where you can buy in and then you get a barrel of fresh Palisade peaches, uh, Rocky mountain Palisade peaches. Uh, yeah. Oh, sounds good, man. 
Yeah, we've got we, we've got one here in Birmingham called Jones Valley Urban Farm, and it's it's in downtown. And the way they set it up a lot is, you know, they'll they'll, they'll give away the spaces. So as long as you come and plant some of the seeds and you tend it and water it, you know, yeah. then people can use. So I mean, it's kind of. But I mean, this is so important, and I'm realizing this more and more as I try to eat healthy foods. It's expensive. So not 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 only are are the healthy foods not present, yeah. heaven forbid you do want to eat healthy. I could, we talked to the other day, you know, I could get a Wendy's meal for $4, okay. a four for four with all I need. And if I wanted to get like a thing of apples and bananas and all that, and depending on the season, uh, you're talking eight, nine, 10, you know, and it's not even, uh, yeah. So it's, it's trouble. Healthy it's trouble. Expensive. But, yep. uh, you know, something like the big food forest, that that's a big help because like we said before, you know, access to fresh produce yep. areas like this, um, is more important than ever. Well, if you're joining us for the first time, this is our opening segment called Leading Off with Brian. We start off with feel-good stories. We tie them back to leadership. Again, taking care of, they they could have built something else on that land, Brian, but they decided to go ahead and do something good for the entire community, which I which I love. So another good leadership trait is, is hey, if you have hard work, perseverance, good things pay off, but then you always have to give back. You always got to serve others. I think that's our that's our closing story for for this segment. It is, and this is my favorite story of the day. Uh, okay. This is uh, about a man who may have one of the greatest comeback stories of all time. So, back in 1961, a guy by the name of Calvin Tyler enrolled at Morgan State, what was called Morgan State College at the time. It's Morgan State Got University it. in Maryland. Go Got Bears! It. Yes. Um, and he was the first person in his family to attend college. It was a big deal. Unfortunately, he had to drop out of college in 1963 because he couldn't afford uh, the tuition. So what he did is he took a job at uh, UPS. Uh, I don't know. They were a much smaller company. He took a job as a UPS driver in Baltimore. And mm -hmm. over the years, he worked his way up to uh, senior vice president of operations and then he retired in 1998 and joined the uh, the board of directors for UPS. And wow. then almost 60 years after he dropped out of college, because he right. couldn't afford it, uh, Calvin and his wife, Tina, just committed uh, $20 million to the school for need-based scholarships, You know, helping students in the same situation that he was in. And um, they actually already had a scholarship fund in their name at the school, and their donations over the years have helped more than 200 deserving students get an education there at Morgan State. And with their new endowment, they're going to be providing access to college uh, for a generation of, uh, of students who wouldn't have otherwise gotten the chance. So this is a guy that didn't even complete at Morgan State, he could have written them off and said nothing, but he realized the importance of education, saw the impact he could have. And I had I had this one photo up here. This is apparently he's already got a couple a building named after him. Yeah, <laughs> there as well. He's he's been giving. This isn't brand new. the The story is that in addition to what they've already given, he just uh, he and his wife Tina just gave another twenty million dollars for this uh, scholarship endowment. Wow. Wow. So again, what's our what's our leadership lesson here? Is it never give up? Is it always give back? Is it you don't need a college education to go as far as you want to go? What's the it's what's the takeaway? It's never give up. So there was that part of the story, but then it's also about you know looking back and trying to now now that you've become successful to help others who uh, were you know possibly in the same situation that you were in, and not just say, well, I got mine, and you know screw everybody else, but to, to yeah. give, give back when you can. Cause 20 million is no, I mean, that's a lot, that's a lot of money to give away. I mean, you, you, you can do a lot for your, that's a lot of money. Yeah. You, I mean, you, you can give it to the family tree, you can give it to somebody else, you know? So, wow. All right. Three good stories, man. Way to get us, way to get us started. That fires me up. Just, yeah. just puts me, puts me in a really good mood and gets us ready for our next segment. A little something I call buddy lead it or leave it.
falls down. All right, so this is this is not a game. This is let's do a role play. If we were doing a training class or a leadership training class, this is a real life role play. There's no right or wrong answers to any of these. But we want to give you all some real life scenarios and let you process, use your critical thinking skills, and start thinking about how you would handle this if you were the CEO. So in these scenarios I'm going to give you that are real life scenarios, you're the person in charge. You're the you're the director, you're the president, you're the CEO, uh, you're the one in charge. And so you get to make a decision. So if you decide to lead it, that means I'm all in. I'm leading it, I'm buying it. If you decide to leave it, you're like, as a leader, I don't want to touch this. I think it's fine the way it is type of stuff. So we're going to look for your comments here to kind of help us out and get us get us kind of engaged. Apparently, Madison likes the lead it or leave it concept. So I thought we were going to over under. <laughs> she forgets. Not time yet. All right. So let's get started with a little something. Let's see if I can find a little. Oh, I got to click on it. There it is. All right, boy. All right. Brian, do you know what's happening today? What announcement came out today around theme parks in the Orlando area? Do you have any idea? Uh, yes, it's because it's it's International Potato Chip Day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for fill us in. Yeah. Uh, well, I was looking for the photo, but here it is. This is a little something called Universal Epic Adventure. Now, this is in Florida, Universal Studios has, they call themselves three theme parks. They've got the original, then they've got Islands of Adventure. They count their water park, Volcano Bay, as their fourth theme park. And so this would be, I'm sorry, their third theme park. This would be their fourth theme park. It's going to be across the street, across International Drive. They broke ground on 750 acres and all this stuff about a year and a half ago. It's going to be a huge third theme park. And then, Brian, they had to stop. COVID. COVID, my friend. So again, construction was halted back in July and everybody thought this project was dead because again, billions, it costs billions of dollars to build a theme park. Can you recoup that right now? Today, the CEO of Universal, uh, Universal and Comcast and that big parent came back and said, the restart of construction of Epic Universe is a terrific moment for our employees and for our theme park business in Florida. Now they're going to try and turn their two park resort plus the water park into a week long it's going to have 750 acres, um, and they're thinking about adding some new things like um, uh, Universal Classic Monsters. They want to bring Super Mario World. Um, that's going to be the most immersive and innovative theme park that they've ever had. So here is the question for you, my friend, and we'll start with you. Should Universal resume construction of the Epic Universe theme park in Orlando? Brian, if you say lead it, you're like, Absolutely. Now's the time. Theme parks are coming back. Let's do this. If you're a leave it, you're like, let's leave it for a year, another two years. They still got Barney in the original theme parks. Can we change out Barney <laughs> and some other stuff? So what's your take? And everybody else, you, you can start typing in the comments as well. Are you And, and tell us why. Are you going to lead it? Or are you going to leave it? What's your thought, buddy? I, my, my, all right. So my first initial thought is when when COVID is under control in the United States and it looks like we're, you know, it's going to be sort of, I don't mean that COVID-19 is like the flu. What I mean is it would be, we would manage it like we manage the flu where you get a flu shot every year. You're probably going to have to get a COVID vaccination every year or whatever. Okay. My point is when that's sort of under control, as soon as that happens, companies like this, uh, like Universal, like Disney, they can't wait. They can't wait for that. Like it, they need to be ramping up to be able to reopen as soon as possible. As soon as it's safe yeah. uh, is, is my, is my opinion. And, but what, what strikes me more than anything else is, you know, did you say how many people they're going to employ? Well, Universal currently employs 25,000, and this will allow them to, they'll need an extra 14,000 just, just for this. So that goes back to the question, where are you going to find 14,000 more workers when all these people have currently been laid off? And I was talking about this, about Disneyland. My wife and I were talking about Disneyland. How many of those, you know, middle-class workers couldn't wait a year for Disneyland to reopen if it ever will. How many of them have already left and gone and done stuff because they need to feed their families? So as soon as Disneyland reopens, hey, everybody, come back, all the workers. It could be up to a third, maybe a half of them. Got, you know, so 
The so school, you, it, in Central Florida is going to be uh, super thin. It was thin when yeah. was thin twenty years ago. When yeah, it, listen. I mean, I'm all about I'm all about building new theme parks because I love them. But on this one, I'm a leave it. I'm like, I know you want to get going and all that, but think about all the changes that have just happened in one year. Everything around queue line spacing to sitting next to each other to whatever. So you're building a theme park based on the old model. There's so many new things we don't know about. What? How do you set up your turnstiles and how do you do all your say? And you, you've got to. Re so I would wait until a lot of this stuff kind of comes up. My daughter, of course, says, leave it and go to Disney. That's a good leader. That's my girl. Uh, <laughs> Sherry says, leave it, focus on building their workforce. Yeah, that's, she kind of says what we're saying. Get your get your workforce back. Caleb wants to build it. Caleb would say, go, baby, go. We are building it. We are full steam ahead. All right. Um, interesting. Let's, let's go to the next one, buddy. Um, have you heard about Trader Joe's? Um, yes. <laughs> I've heard about Trader Joe's. Hey, what do you know about Trader Joe's? <laughs> There. Yeah. I shop there. Uh, I shop there once a week. Okay. Uh, love Trader Joe's. Uh, yeah. It's my my family likes it. It tends to be uh, you know a good value for the food. Yeah. Do I stand behind the firing of a Trader Joe's employee? So yeah. Well, let's tell you the story. So basically, this happened at a and again, Trader Joe's is very. If you're watching from somewhere else, you may not have, we finally have one in Birmingham. We took, it took years and years, but we've got one in Birmingham. So it's a very popular, um, uh, kitschy, if you will, um, you know, grocery chain that's, it's it started in California, didn't it, Brian? I mean, I'm, I think that's where it, where it began, but basically a Trader Joe's worker was, says he was fired after writing directly to the CEO calling for stronger COVID protocols. So he wrote them a letter and said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, and let me see, I, I've got it here, but you won't be able to see it very well. Um, yeah, that's not, I mean, there you go. But I mean, it's, it, he, he says things like uh, improve your air filtration. Uh, don't allow people in the store without masks. Um, remove uncooperative customers. We put our lives on the line every day by showing up. Please, why don't you, Trader Joe, show up for us and adopt these policies? So coincidentally, karma, accidentally, <laughs> he's fired uh, the next day. And Trader Joe's, of course, uh, has one of these, you know, forms that they fill out and all the reasons. And the reason they claim he was fired is for basic uh, insubordination type of thing. And and here's why. Le let me show you real quick. I'm going to share my screen here. Let me share a uh, screen too, because this is one that really we all need to need to pay attention to. Um, all right, there we are. So let's take a look at Trader Joe's values here. So I've got them right here on the screen. Let me blow them up a little bit. So according to uh, the CEO, there's seven values, Brian, that are important. Integrity, a product-driven company. Wow, customer service. No bureaucracy. Kaizen, which is all about lean and, and Six Sigma and efficiency. The store is the brand and we're a national chain, but of neighborhood grocery stores. So you got all these, all these values here. The number one value on there is what, Brian? Integrity. Integrity. So that's, that seems to be the question is some says it, it, it's good that you showed integrity by, you know, getting with the CEO Others are going to say you didn't show good integrity because you kind of didn't follow the corporate policy of complaints and kind of all, all that stuff. And what they said was the reason he was fired, Trader Joe's came out and said he was not fired. He was not fired for writing the letter. He was fired because he didn't align his work with the company values and some of the things that he has done in the past have been, um, he's gotten a lot of cu some customer complaints and kind of things like that. And the other thing that you can't see on this, Brian, but we do a lot of training on documentation and what you should write and what you shouldn't write. There's some stuff written on this particular form that might give him some ammo when he goes back. So, well, but let me ask you this. Here's, here's the question for all you who are watching and listening. If an employee writes a letter to the CEO that says, you're not taking care of us. You're not doing this. I don't feel safe here. Um, we work so hard. You should work hard for us. Should that employee be fired? Do you lead it and go, yes, I'm sorry. It's a right to work state. I don't like that you did that. Uh, I'm going to lead it and stand behind the firing. Or do you leave it and go, 
I wouldn't fire this guy with that because it doesn't really have enough just on that merit. So, Brian, what's your thought, buddy? You uh, you absolutely should not fire somebody for speaking truth to power and for doing the right thing, uh, you know, by especially when it's invited by the corporation to by the organization to to, you know, speak up. And we have like uh, suggestion boxes or like my company has a dear CEO email that you can, you know, write directly to the to the CEO. Yeah. Um, however, I'm not. I wonder, you know, if somebody, this this particular gentleman was, um, you know, vocal enough to uh, stand up and write this letter and say things like, you know, we come in and stand up for you, you need to stand up for us. And then that kind of tracks with what they're saying about him uh, actually being terminated for uh, disrespect that he's been showing to customers. So, Correct. It, Correct. Yeah. There's a, Trader Joe's came out with a statement and said, there's, min, there's misinformation about him being terminated. We terminated him because he showed disrespect to our customers. We have, quote, we have never and would never terminate a crew member's employment for raising safety concerns. So there's there's a backstory here, I'm sure, that we do or do not know um, what kind of goes on there. Um, let's see what everybody uh, said here. Let's see. Um, oh, well, we got some, I, I think, oh, we, we, we've got some of these coming in really late. And I apologize for that. Here's here's the first one. This is this is going back to Universal. Jacob's going to leave Universal. Hey, Stone, thanks for watching, buddy. You're going to leave leave Universal. Greg's going to lead. He's going to build it out. Um, Marla says, lead it. It'll help get Central Florida back in business. And it'll be built when they get. She's tracking with Brian, of mm -hmm. course. Good. Hey, how you doing there? TV Richard. How would you pronounce that? That's uh, TV's Richard Garo. Garo. Garo, Garak, Guru. Florida has great control over COVID. Take time to do it. My, my wife's still upset. There's no college program at Disney. So all that kind of stuff. So, all right, let's talk about this one now. My buddy Stone says, get the guy out of here. So he's going to lead it. Fire him. Don't talk bad about the organization. Sherry says, you shouldn't be fired for offering a suggestion. He should be coached to provide feedback in a more congenial way. And again, but Richard says, feels like he was demanding. If you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. So again, this is sort of the, you know, th this is where leadership is hard. Um, do I think you should be fired for this letter? Probably not. However, what's the whole backstory? And Brian, you kind of looked at some of that article too. I did. And what wasn't clear to me is he wrote, he wrote the email directly to the CEO, correct? It right. Wasn't, it wasn't like he wrote like an open letter and published it in the, the New York Times. Yeah. Because that can get you fired. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you see how this is going. So again, I, I, I got one more tough one for you, buddy. So let's let's talk about the Tokyo Olympics. I think I've got a graphic. Do I have a graphic? Hang on, buddy. There it is. Are you excited? Are you an Olympic guy? Tokyo 2020 coming in 2021. I was Are, yeah, I was a little disappointed that we didn't have the Olympics last summer. But don't worry. They're coming, man. They are coming to Tokyo with a caveat. No fans from abroad. No international fans. They, they announced that they'll take place without any fans when they open in five months. Um, and again, this hasn't been announced yet. This is... Uh, sources involved in the discussion say that no international fans will be coming. And again, because people who live in Tokyo are saying we would prefer not to have people there, even if they're vaccinated, All, having no fans will be costly. However, Brian, here's the number. The organizing committee has budgeted income of $800 million from ticket sales. And that shortfall will have to be made up by Japanese government entities. Yeah. So this is not, they're just taking a bath. This is going to come out. It feels like it's going to come out of your tax, <laughs> like wh whatever tax structure. I don't even know what they have, what they have in place out there. So again, looking ahead to five months down the road, should Tokyo allow international fans and avoid this $800 million shortfall? If so, you're going to lead it. If you lead it, you say, lead it, bring everybody in. We need the revenue. We need the money. We'll check for vaccinations. Or are you going to leave it and say, nope, I'm going to leave it and leave the fans at home. We're going to take a bath on this, but it's better than a huge pandemic coming to our country. Brian? I'm going to leave it. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, you know, in a normal year, I'd be all about leading that. But 
it's not a normal year and we're not quite, you know, worldwide, we're not out of the forest yet with the pandemic. And, and I just can't imagine the uh, bureaucracy and the, uh, uh, I just can't ima imagine the infrastructure that it would take to f let people fly in from all over the world I mean, already they're going to have to do this with the athletes, right? Everybody's going to have right. to fly in early, quarantine, check for vaccinations, all that. How are you going to do that with hundreds of thousands or even a million, uh, you know, fans from all over the world? You're just going to have to skip it this time and watch it on TV. But here's the deal, and I'm going to say lead it, and here's why. If you're going, you're taking the risk. And so if I live in Japan and I don't want to be around that, I know it's in my country. I feel like I want to go, but I can't go anyways, because even if nobody comes, because we're not letting locals in either. So I'll stay home. I won't do that. But these, these are the most expensive Olympics on record, more so than Brazil a few years ago. The official cost is going to be $15 billion to put on the Olympics, although two government audits say it might be twice that much. Yeah. So to that, you might say $800 million to drop in the drop in the bucket when it comes to 15 or 20 billion, but you're going to need every cent to get back on there. So what would, what would be the cost though, if you import, you know, hundreds of thousands of fans and start another uh, epidemic in Japan, I'd have them sign a waiver. They had to sign a waiver. No, I'm not worried about them. <laughs> <laughs> Coming into Japan. Right. right. And I think, and I think that's the pushback is that, you know, international people are like, let us come if we want to come, but this is my small nation, my small country. My daughter, she's with you, buddy. She says, leave it. Okay. Uh, Richard's with me. He's like, you know, let's go. <laughs> Boy, got China support Japan. Lead it. Absolutely. Hey, Joseph, good to see you tonight. Joseph. He wants to bring him in too, Brian. Bring in a limited number of people. You get the revenue. You check for vaccines. And five months from now, we all, they, they've already announced here in Alabama, University of Alabama is going to allow full stadiums come September, 80,000 people to all the football games or 100,000 in Alabama. So if we're doing that, then why are we watching empty Olympic venues? Now, on the other hand, Sherry says, you know, leave it. Uh, this creates great opportunities for people of Japan to get to attend. So let them, if people from all over the world were there, how many local people could even get tickets? I think the story, Sherry says, that no fans at all are allowed. But I like this scenario, which is, Fill it with the locals. That way, they they're all they're all vaccinated. Yeah. Anyhow, just these are the critical thinking skills. These are the leadership traits. These are the creative problem solving that I think all of us have to go through on a regular basis as a leader. So thanks for playing along, even though it wasn't really a game. If only we had like a real live game show we could play. Yeah, give yourself a bell. Give yourself a bell. The world famous, most popular, highly watched statistics, leadership, interactive game show streaming on a Wednesday night that's highest rated across the country. It's over and under. It's over, it's over and under. It's cool, baby. <laughs> Me too. Me too. So uh, if you're joining us for the first time, here's how uh, this game show works. Um, it's everybody's favorite leadership statistic. <laughs> uh, and what's going to happen is um, I'm going to present Pete and our audience with a few interesting and timely statistics. And you're going to have to decide if the actual number is over or under the line that I give you. So Correct. Um, zero out of three, you feel sad. One out of three. Okay. At least you didn't get zero. Two out of three. You are very close to being a leader. Three out of three, you put your name in the comments and you get a free Chip and Laughs Tumblr mug sent right with your own name on it that says Smoking Hot and your name. That's not true. These probably are way too expensive for that. No doubt. I'm not buying anybody anything. But you will have the power to say you were three out of three. And you'll get that. This is what we're competing for. Right? Oh, oh. So uh, feel free to play along. Uh, we would love for you to chat in your answers as we try to guess over and under. Uh, so, and and we always have uh, some of our participants, Pete, uh, some of our listeners will actually uh, type in not only over or under, but their reasons, the reason behind it. And uh, I know after last week's uh, episode, I, I went up and 
uh, my wife had been watching the show and had to cut out like right before we had our third one and she was really interested to know and that we talked about like, you know, why things might be that way. So, um, this is, this is, uh, this is what we bring to you with over. Oh, oh, it goes beyond just this five minutes. I mean, you're going to discuss this all week with your loved ones. So (laughs) as get your kids, bring your kids in, let's do it. All right. So, um, March 8th, Pete, is this coming Monday, and it is International Women's Day. I tip my hat. International Women's Day. This is a global day that celebrates the the social and economic and cultural and political achievements of women around the world. And since March 8th happens to fall right in between two Leadership and Laugh episodes, I figured we should take today and maybe next week even to cover some of the interesting findings from the 2020 Women in the Workplace report. Yes. Are you familiar with that report? I'm familiar with women. I am familiar with work. (laughs) Put them together, women in the workplace. I do not know this study. The Women in the Workplace study is conducted annually by McKinsey and Company uh, in partnership with LeanIn.org, and it is the largest comprehensive study of the state of women in corporate America, with more than 40,000 employees at all levels of the organization who were uh, surveyed about their work uh, workplace experience. You know, you're setting me up for a really bad evening at home. Because as I guess these answers and give you my story behind them, I'm going to walk downstairs post-show into the green room, if you will, yeah. as my wife stares at me with daggers and says, you're an idiot. You're not even close. Yeah. yeah. So thanks. This is going to be good. I, I believe me, as I was putting this together, I was thinking, uh, <laughs> um, this is, uh, yeah. all right. So without further ado, let's get yes, let's, let's go. All right. So women make up uh, 47% of the entry-level positions in the corporate uh, pipeline. So entry-level position, women are almost half, right? Uh, 47% in entry-level position. Okay. What percentage of senior manager slash director level positions are held by women? Oh, my gosh. Is it over or under 30%? Okay. 30% of entry level positions are held by, I'm sorry, 47% of percent. level positions are held by women. What percentage of senior manager or director level positions are held by women? Over I wish 30%. I wish it was over. I really do. I don't think it is. I think that's why we're still having a lot of struggles and challenges and pushback and questions and equal pay and all these things that are that are coming up because I've, it, it's got to be lower than that um, because that's just the way that that it seems. And again, a lot of stuff goes unreported. We don't always know everything that's happening, but I'm going to I'm see, 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 this doesn't even include frontline because if if you included frontline leaders or frontline managers or, or, or frontline people, then I would think it would be over. But you have specifically said senior level and director level correct so so unfortunately i am still taking the under um as is my daughter who says under hey jonathan good to see you tonight buddy thanks for coming in he's taking the under um however don't forget i mean sherry she says no and and again she is a high level working woman so she may know that no i'm seeing this all the time where i work in, in the departments they're out there so that could be, hey, Anthony, what's happening in St. Pete? Go Bucks! Good to see you taking the over. Greg's taking the over. Uh, this is a good question. Does senior level count principals, or is this just the business world? Um, you know what? This is just corporate. Um, it's just corporate. That You bring up something very interesting uh, that I might well, get in a future over under okay. uh, about, about uh, education and specifically uh, principals and and the impact they have on their schools. That'll be good. That'll be I good. So, baby, yeah, it. stick with stick with the under. Marla, who's watching tonight, is sticking with the under. And our buddy Joseph from the Northeast, he's going to go barely. As oh. as Lee as Lee Corso says, just a bit, just a little bit. Joseph, closer. 
It is over, but just barely. So 33% is your answer. Joseph, nailed it. <laughs> now, here's the deal. That's still low. That's still a third. However, that's higher than I thought. You know? well, here's some so. additional good news. It's, it's actually 5% higher than the previous five years. Got so it. it's definitely trending in the right direction. Uh, when we talk about now, when we talk about the corporate pipeline, there were actually a bunch of different, uh, you know, uh, breaks in that. So you've got your entry level positions, you've got your manager, your senior manager, director, you've got your VP, SVP, and the C suite. Yes. See my arm going all the way over here. <laughs> <laughs> hang on, hang on. Let me oh, widen your oh, screen. Oh, there oh, you go. There oh. you go. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, okay. But when, all right. So it's it's. It's actually in all of those categories up over the last five years. So trending in the right direction. Okay. What's the next one? All right. This is an interesting one, you guys. Uh, get ready for lots of good discussion and for Pete to potentially uh, have to sleep on the couch tonight. <laughs> Let's talk about the division of child care and household labor during COVID. Uh-oh. Um, so in the survey... 72% of fathers who were surveyed, 72% said they think they are splitting the household labor equally with their partner during COVID. So whether you always thought it was 50% or you thought like, hey, COVID hit and now we're in it together, we're 50-50 here. So 72% of surveyed fathers said they think they're splitting we're the 50 50 over. we're split yeah we're all do we're all helping out we're half and half but what do the mamas say uh what percent of surveyed mothers said that they think the household labor is actually split with their partner let's go a little lower is it over or under 59 percent all right that number concerns me the reason why you chose that number because i think it's lower because i and here's why. I think the disparity has to be more because we as men are just stupid. So the fact that like 72% of men think it's 50-50, oh, we all helped out. It's got to be It's got to be less than 59 because women, it's probably 50, maybe 48 of them who said, listen, no one's doing 50-50. I'm, I'm working and I'm coming home and I'm doing more and all that. So I am going to take the under again, as will my wife. All right. Good. Hey, Logan, thanks for watching tonight, buddy. Appreciate that. Jennifer's joined us tonight. Thanks, Jennifer. So good to see. Look, look at that icon, Brian. Look at that Disney icon there. She's got Taking away by the balloons. Love it. Love it. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah. Greg is also going to be in trouble tonight. Not just under 59. <laughs> way, <laughs> way under. You did not stop anybody on this. If the answer is over, Joseph's taken the under. Marla's taken the under. What do you got, buddy? Uh, well, you stumped all of us. No, uh, everybody gets it right, but I'm giving the bell to Greg Busby, who said way under. It's way under. It's only 44%. And, you know, this isn't really about dad bashing. Um, I Thank think, you. I think more than anything, it identifies a huge perception gap between domestic partners. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I feel like you know, I feel like everything is equal because I ordered dinner and took out the trash that one time. Um, uh, <laughs> back in the before times when corporate travel was a thing, my wife would have to leave for a week at a time sometimes and go to their corporate offices in, in uh, central Florida. And it was never more, um, and it, it was never more apparent than when she was gone for a week, when she came back, I would always say, thank you so much for all you do around here because yes. it, not even 60 40 you know like when i have to do it all by myself i realize how much she uh carries and and i like i said it, you know that's just how it is in our family yeah but um you know i, I think when you but, have, if yeah, you have go, all all these people the question uh you know is your division of labor 50 50 and 72 percent of men go oh, yeah we're you know we're where it's half and half, and then only 44%, that's 30% less, 
uh, on, on the women's side. So, wow. And you know what, here's the deal. You, you have to have the expectation with your spouse or your partner anyways, because we never made the, I shouldn't say, gosh, I shouldn't out us. We rarely made the bed when we both were working, driving and commuting to work, you know, cause by the time we get home at six and all that now we tend to make the bed because we're at home all day and we go in the room. We want to see it cause we're working from home and all that kind of stuff. And there's some days when like, I'll, I'll come out and I'll go, baby, I made the bed today. And then, you know, because I'm a guy and she's like, well, that's great. I made it the past four days, <laughs> the past four days in a row. Uh, hey, Richard's going to share our show with his 1.5 million viewers, his connections. Thanks, buddy. Get it out there. Maybe we'll end up getting sponsored dollars so we can actually give out free prizes. All right. What, what's the last one, buddy? <laughs> All right. Last one. Since this is a leadership show, uh, well, I just threw my pen. Since this is a leadership show, we'll talk a little bit about senior level women in the workplace. So, so these are our leaders uh, in, in, in the various organizations in which we work. So in 2020, 41% of men who were surveyed said they, um, we're talking about during COVID, right? Right. 41% of the men surveyed said they consistently felt exhausted during COVID, senior leaders. What percent of women senior leaders said the same thing? That, 87. That they <laughs> consistently felt exhausted. Uh, for, for men, it was 41%. Over or under 49% for women. Oh, oh over. Over. Oh, over. Over. You didn't even, I said 87. You should have got, come on. No, over. Women are more exhausted. They're working. They always work harder than men. They take on additional stress besides the men. If they're a, a caregiver, whether they're a primary caregiver or not, they've got that. If there's people in the family, um, you know, elder care, things like they're worried about that. Um, but they complain about it. Do women complain do about it? Yeah. Do women? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, there, there, and again, if the word is complain, I may have changed it a little bit, but it's not okay. It's, yeah. it, it's yeah. a you know how many how many of you uh, say that you consistently feel exhausted? I'm not yeah. talking about like once in a while everybody gets tired. I no, mean, consistently, you're, you're consistently like approaching burnout. Listen, I work with, and I hope they're not watching, I work with, you know, a lot of my coworkers are women. And again, a lot of them are working and homeschooling because there's the online stuff and they've got things going on. And then there's health issues with their parents and all that. And just today I was talking to one of them and I said, are you excited about taking a few days off for being a spring break? She's like, I am so, ex she literally said, I am so exhausted. I need time off. So, I mean, like I said, I, if you got us here, you got us, but Again, I think, again, being the teacher at the house, Jennifer's over. What do you got, Brian? Did anyone say under? No one said under. Good. No one. Gets a bell. It's over. It's 54% of women. Uh, That's all? Yeah. 54? Well, now you're, you're talking senior level leadership, right? Okay. I think the story here is the the gap between 41% of male senior leaders feeling exhausted yeah. all the time and 54% of women leaders feeling exhausted all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, but furthermore, uh, women senior level leaders are one and a half times more likely than their male counterparts to think about downshifting their careers or leaving the workforce entirely uh, because of COVID-19. So and wow. the ones who are actually considering that, three out of four uh, cite burnout as the reason. I'm, I'm going to say something that may come across as sexist. I hope it does, and I apologize if it does. But is there a possibility that because we're talking about senior leaders, high-level executive women, these are women who may have either worked their way to the top and been hard performers and hard workers and put in 60-hour days and kind of type A personalities who can do it all. So by the time you get to that level, you really don't complain about stress and all that because you live for it. You love it. You need it. So it, cause there's like 48% or 46 who really, you said don't. So the 54% does. So that's just a thought there, but also the gap, you said the gap, the gap is huge. So, um, uh, women are slightly more emotional. It's been a tough year. And again, the worrying about everything and taking care of people's health and all that is huge. Hey, if you got three for three, be like Joseph. 
put your put it in put it in the comments. Say three for three. I feel good because we got a special treat for you in just a second. You actually do get a sort of pseudo prize, uh, <laughs> a pseudo prize for going three for three. But you can't win if you don't tell us about it. So make sure that you uh, put that in the comments uh, as we get ready for our final segment, my friend. Where is it? There it is. It is time for the Daily Disney. We only got about four minutes left, but I do want to, uh, we'll do something real quick tonight. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, Greg, awesome. Anthony and uh, Joseph, we'll do the three of you because you put that in there. Give me a number between one and 55. So Greg Busby, Anthony Hughes, and Joseph, type in there a number between one and 55. Me and Brian will take a few seconds and finish us out with some knowledge from the 55 ways of how to add Disney magic to your organization. Again, Brian and I worked there for a long time. We're passionate about Disney. And while Disney isn't the perfect organization, right, because no organization is, uh, they still do a lot of things right. They still uh, do a lot of um, leadership right, customer service, customer experience. So we'll start with Anthony. Anthony, thank you, buddy. Chapter eight. Oh, this is perfect for you, Anthony. Uh, act like a leader at all times. <laughs> act like a leader at all times. That's one of the things, Brian, that I think both of us learned at Disney was there's so much internal growth and development. There's so many chances for promotions that as soon as you get there, you need to turn on the switch, whether you have the title or not, and act like a leader at all times. Because in a big organization, people are moving and getting promoted and doing things and all that. You it doesn't care what your title is. You need to act that role every single day. Because if you don't, everybody else is. And you wonder why people aren't getting promoted over you. And you think, well, I'll start acting like a leader once I get promoted. It's going to pass you by. And that that's for a big or a small organization. So you agree with that, buddy? I do. Leadership doesn't really have to do as much with your title as it does, uh, you know, with how you act in the organization. Absolutely. That, good job, Greg. Congratulations, 27. We just talked about this. Uh, create, is it there? Yep. Create create a fun work environment. I was I was speaking at the uh, Trustville where I live has a, has a fire officers conference. And I, I was doing some, some speaking for them at, at an all day, two day fire uh, officers conference uh, in Trustville. And one of the things I talked about was creating a fun work environment. And again, when you think about public safety and police, they're like, our jobs are dangerous. There's safety involved, may not be fun. And you always want to put safety first. But I'm telling you, when we talk about recruitment and retention and people changing jobs and all these studies are out about people who are going to change jobs during COVID, someone's got to make the work fun. Yeah. I, and Brian, we're not talking about, you know, you've got to walk around and be like, ooh, like, you know, goofy all day. But there has to be, there has to be something, right? There has to be something fun so that people, you know, a lot of people say that's not my job as the leader. You need to create the culture. Yeah. Okay, so do whatever you can to kind of make it fun. Joseph, we'll finish up strong with you. Chapter 42. Nice, nice one, my buddy. Also my old television station. Ah, consistency, my friend. Create a consistent guest experience. Disney, me and Brian could do a whole hour show on consistency. Because again, when you go to the Magic Kingdom, you want the same experience you get at Epcot. You want the same experience you get at Coronado Springs. Just because the Grand Floridian people pay $500 a night for a room and the All-Star Resorts guests pay $99, $129 for a room. It's probably been gone up since then. <laughs> <laughs> Years ago. They want a consistent guest experience. And the other problem that Brian and I always had, not a problem, but the biggest challenge we had was something called third-party operating participants. Tell us about that, yeah. Brian. Vendors who might be uh, there and to, from a guest perspective, might appear to be the same as as you, even though they're a different company. Uh, so trying to hold them to the same standards can be difficult. 
Right. And we used to do a traditions program, which is new hire orientation for Disney cast members. But they also had to do it if you worked at the Rainforest Cafe over at downtown Disney or you worked at maybe an operating participant. You had to come through traditions to know because guests guests don't know. You're all wearing a name tag. Y'all, you know, look like you were. It's kind of like when you go to a football game or somewhere and you complain and they're like, oh, that's our staffing. They're outsourced. They're not part of our university. No. We don't know that. We don't care. It's it's all it's all the same. So, three great tips there: create a consistent guest experience, um, have some fun at work, create a fun work environment, and what was the first one? Remember what eight was? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I got to be honest. Either do I? Oh, act act like a leader. Act like a leader. Act like a leader at all times. Oh my word! We should. You and I should know better. I was, oh, I, was buddy. My, uh, I was going good. to do this thing here. You're good. Hey, good show tonight. Good show, buddy. Can you hear the music? Yes. Yeah. I love a good closing theme song. You can close us off. So um, thank you all for watching. We couldn't do it without you. We like to have fun. Hopefully it's been the best hour of your week. And Brian, with your most famous words. Uh, we just want to say, like Pete said, you know, we really appreciate all of you for joining us live or listening on the podcast. Let's all go out there and do our part this week to uh, be kind to one another and put some more love in the world. That's it. That's it. Thanks, everybody. See you.